Sure, absolutely. I know today's been crazy busy for us too. Uh, let me make you presenter. All right, do you see this screen? Yep. Okay, so 57 year old, never smoker, who presented with gradual onset of worsening dyspnea and had a run of three or four CTs that look strikingly similar to this. Uh, this is, this did end up going to surgical lung biopsy, so we have the answer, but I'm curious what you think, because we've shown cases that look very similar to this in the past where in the upper lobes, I would argue you don't really see much of a wall to some of these areas of, of lucent lung that would support that being central lobular emphysema. And I think it, maybe, I don't remember if it was David or Jeff or somebody when we've coined the term like discrete central lobular emphysema in the past for things that may look like that. But then you get a little bit, you know, a little bit lower in his lungs that some of these start to have maybe some walls to them. And so, what do you guys think? Emphysema or cystic lung disease in a never, smoker. lifelong never smoker? Never smoker. How old again? 57. And male, female, sorry. It's a, it's male, yeah. Okay. And right, I, I'm not trying to hide any sort yeah, of- Yeah, no, that's why I'm trying to get all the data points. I'm gonna go with yeah. emphysema. Anybody else, David, Peter, anyone else on here want to venture a guess? Because I- I'll say cystic I, lung. Okay. How, how, are, the, how are the pulmonary uh, arteries? What'd you say? How are the pulmonary vessels? Like, yeah, they look okay. Yeah. yeah. There, so were, there were some, some of the lesions in the upper lungs had vessels in the center of the hole, which goes along with the emphysema part. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, so I I agree with all that. I mean, we've seen several cases of this, and I, like you guys, thought probably central lobular emphysema, but was very nervous about that when they said he was a never smoker. Uh, so I would go surgical. with I would go with non emphysema, based on what I've seen. I just started I just started looking. Oh yeah, no yeah. So Howard Upper Lobe, so never smoker, fifties. You know, no relevant. He he's worked in industries where he's been an office manager, not like heavily exposed to anything. And so they did send him to surgical lung biopsy and it was all central lobular emphysema. And so you know, obviously the clinician was surprised and stumped and, and doesn't really, because he doesn't know what to do. And I, I like his note, he's like, to my great surprise, the final pathology is consistent with severe emphysema. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's another one of these ones because I know I've shown two other ones that have been biopsied, you know, when you elicit the same discussion. So, and never injected anything no no mm. and i just wonder I mean, there's got to be I, I was reading you know there was one article i found talking about uh, telomere mutations and and emphysema but i mean it, his alpha one is negative I mean, there's got to be some other susceptibility it must be some sporadic mutation because he doesn't really have a family history either but yeah i think as I'm as David and Jeff pointed out you know, some of this, the central dots and the absence of any walls in a lot of these, but it's tough. And I think it highlights too that, you know, sometimes I think surgical lung biopsy is appropriate. It's not all clear cut. And I, I'll just make this one editorial comment that even though you've got a path report and I haven't read it, of course, that simply says emphysema, that isn't necessarily the absolute truth because if they just use emphysema to describe the presence of cystic spaces in the lungs and that's it, that may not that, be ordinary yeah. emphysema. I, I'm shortening it. You're you're correct. Yeah, this was this was reviewed extensively at our ILD conference with the path there. You know, we discussed amyloid, all the stains. They, they had a surgical lung biopsy from two different sites. You know, but you're right, Howard. Yeah, but they, you know, there was. I don't think they left any stone unturned in this case. All right, a couple of quick cardiac cases. We've had a run of these lately. This is a patient who presented with chest pain. And as you uh, can see right here, so he's got some coronary, some coronary calcium proximally has a stent in the LAD that may 
be related to this, but came in with chest pain and was noted to have this pericardial effusion. And this was a coronary CTA done. I don't know if they had another PECT or if maybe they saw this on echo and saw an area at the apex that looks suspicious. But as you would guess, this did turn out to be a ruptured pseudoaneurysm from his recent myocardial infarct. So the stent had been placed a couple of weeks ago and so it was leaking. Now, the interesting thing about this case was because he had the stent, he was also on Plavix or one of its analogs. And therefore, they actually had to wait on this a couple of days before they took him to the OR to reverse his, his anticoagulation. But he survived and had a good outcome. They just did a you know patch repair there of the, of the apex. Um, but you know, I don't think we see these all too often on imaging just because they, you know, well, fortunately this guy didn't die, but oftentimes if it's a rupture interventricular and creates a BSD, then they usually just go straight to surgery without imaging. So, and you know, the, this was hemopericardium and it's 45, 50 Hounsfield units there. The next one, this is, this one came in you know, within a week of the other one. And this patient you can see has actually undergone a median sternotomy, which was fairly recent also for myocardial infarct. So he had bypass graft and you can see, even though it's a non-con, he had his lima harvested or, or bypassed. And he had this big thing here, which, Obviously, you wouldn't want to biopsy this without seeing contrast. And you know, this is a fun one to show the residents to, and it, you know, it really does require scrolling through to get your bearings because it's easy to confuse it with what is there. But you know, seeing that that's the normal left atrium, and that you have this huge pooling of contrast, that this is another ruptured ventricular pseudoaneurysm post MI. And in this case, you know, this, as the surgeons will often say, like. When they do median sternotomies, it creates adhesions, whether it's a you know, pseudoaneurysm post aortic repair or post you know, cabbage, that that may have helped save this patient. You know, if they have adhesions that can contain where the, the rupture actually is. So this guy also survived. They went in and resected this and repaired it. Now, my question for you guys is we all think of, of right sided asymmetric edema in the acute setting described as a classic phenomenon with with papillary muscle muscle rupture after mi and i don't know what the explanation is here i think he's got some edema you know certainly looks like edema in the right upper lobe got a little bit of ground glass non-specific you know, nondescript stuff in the lower lobes i don't know if anybody wants to venture a theory you know on a on a mechanism here other than yeah, this is certainly impinging his left atrium and maybe affecting his mitral valve apparatus and resulting in asymmetric edema. I know Charlie Higgins always used to say that he thought that it was often because patients with coronary or cardiac issues would sleep on their right side just because it reduced the pulsation that they would feel in their chest wall. What about compression um, but, veins here resulting in elevated pressure, so sort of shunting of blood to the right? Yeah, right. I don't know. Uh, like, I, think that's a great thought, but I wonder yeah. if that's contributing a little bit. Right. Kind of like, yeah, if you uh, see PE somewhere, sometimes obstructing areas that the other areas are hyperperfused and get edema as a result. Right. But don't you think that a uh, pseudoaneurysm also affected his uh, subvalvular apparatus? Because doesn't it, where did that start? I it's it affecting. Started. Well, I see what you're saying. Oh, that's a good it's point. Right, 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 right there. Muscle, right. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think the, the the mitral valve is going to be yeah I, impaired there. I don't know. I think it's interesting to think about. Yeah, and yeah, the other and, thing is that the left atrium is being impinged on too. So the left atrial pressures are high, and that's uh, impairing the venous return. So that's backing up into the right yeah. lung predominantly too. Yeah. But one of the larger pseudoaneurysms I've seen post MI. Yeah. I've got one more. All right. So here's it's another cardiac case, but this one 
you can see there's this, and I'll show it on soft tissue windows, soft tissue intermediate attenuation, kind of encasing the left coronary system, you know, not entirely, and in some areas extending out a little bit beyond. Um, and it's been like that. You know, she, this was incidentally discovered. This is a different study. It's not rapidly growing. You know, in both cases, you can see it, they're pretty similar. And she had multiple other studies. And I will tell you my gut for this, my first instinct on what this was, was turned out to be incorrect. They, this is actually post open biopsy. They did a, a open biopsy of this. And this is an older case, but I just came across it. So what do you guys think? I would wonder about lymphoma, given that it's like not compressing the coronaries that much, yeah. but considering yeah. uh, lymphoma, it's IgG4. funny because it kind of got like little lobules of it. Yeah, right. And IgG4 was what I first thought because I showed a case that uh -huh. was, you know, that a couple of years ago that encasing the coronary arteries that was IgG4. That was my first thought. And that was actually what the initial thought was here. Um, and this turns out to be not malignant. It's not like a, like a it's not a vascular mal. I mean, it's it's kind of lobulated, like like you sometimes see yeah. like mangiomas. And that's that's exactly what this is. It's a cardiac no mangioma, flavor, right? You know, I I was looking. That's why I included this is coronary calcium. Yeah, you know, on one of these. You know, I don't know what that little blush is there, but no, it's there's not typical flebolips. Huh. But this did turn out to be a cardiac mangioma. Wow. So, you know, yeah, I would have, I jumped onto the, just looking at it, just instinctually jumped onto the IgG4 train. And, you know, just, I guess it's caution, a reminder out there because, there are other things that can do this. Not everything's IgG4. That's a no. revelation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jeff, I'll stop there. Okay, thanks. Those were cool. All righty, who would like to go next? I have a few, Jeff. All right, Peter. Small, small. All right, we see your screen. Okay. We have a CTEF. Uh, we started re recently doing the endodirectomies here, so we have a CTEF conference. So I'll show a few uh, of those from a recent conference. So this one is a patient uh, that came in. Uh, was treated for PE about a year ago. So you look at this, and he has a lot of uh, disease here in this right pulmonary artery but so he's treated acutely but you look at this 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 has some features of of chronicity and like one of that one i think is a good show is one of this is like when you see cannulation within the the thrombus that basically show the, that's a sign of uh of chronicity and you can see um in the lungs there's quite a bit of scarring there's probably some some hemorrhage as well down here and uh reticulation which which can go with chronic scarring from prior from prior hemorrhage or infarctions um and then he came in a year later again with uh peas or again with chest pain and you can see he has new p on the left side and you can see this uh thrombus there still that was treated but it didn't respond to therapy just because chronic and you can see again you can see the cannulations so they actually um the other thing to notice on this one is just a good for trainees is what a uh, nice example of a right heart strain so you can see the difference Boeing. so he right heart strain so this guy was uh he went and then he get, this was a submassive p so he was treated um then with a thrombectomy and they went in and they were only able to get stuff out on the left side, which is acute on the right side. They said it was uh, completely scarred down. Nothing could come out. 
So on the right on the right side, he basically needs a endarterectomy, mm -hmm. which is a nice uh, example of acute and chronic. And sometimes you can't tell the difference, and sometimes they're subtle, subtle features like the cannulation, the recannulation within the thrombus. Um, this one's just a very kind of classic textbook example of uh, CTEF. So uh, you can see the chronic thrombus on both sides. Uh, and has other, the other indirect signs, uh, large bronchial arteries, mosaicism. If you look at the lungs also, you can kind of see the, the uh, pruning of the pulmonary vessels. So some of these some of these airways don't have a accompanying. You barely can see the pulmonary arterial next to them, especially in the segments where um, there's hypoattenuation. So mosaic perfusion. So this one's a pretty classic one. It has the right heart findings. So RV hypertrophy, distended right heart chambers. This one is a really subtle, more subtle one. Um, so no, so you look at the lung, at the pulmonary artery, nothing really, no filling defects at all. If you look at the lungs, the lungs don't look completely normal down here. And you can see some of these, some of these uh, vessels are pruning as you get down. So this guy, this, Person, ha this person has a very distal disease only. Very subtle. You can see the uh, mosaicism. Okay, and then I have two non CTEF cases. This one, I looked. My colleague and I read it yesterday together. Uh, my colleague Eugene Berkowitz. So this patient, let's pull it up. So we were asked to look at this uh, CT, which stayed on the list for a long time. Uh, and uh, So there's this linear filling defect here, and then this metallic density right there. Where did that come from? <laughs> yeah, that was the question. So when we started looking at uh, radiographs, so we did notice is that he had a a, a, a pacemaker, a CRTD, with the with the lead in the in the coronary sinus there. So when we started looking at his most recent trust radiograph is right there. And so Eugene noticed this right here, which which seemed funny right there, which is actually where that that is. Right. And so we look farther back. So this was uh, just a few days before the scan. And then this one was a few years ago, like four or five years ago. So we noticed that he had a, a different uh, a different lead. So So you can actually see this lead broke off here. To the tip yeah. of it, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So fractured lead. Wow. Yeah, and then, uh, and I'm assuming this is just a strand of fibrin that just happened, to, you know, and it's not, not, not resolving. So yeah, it looks too stringy and regular to be too, caught. And there's no metal density on it. Um, okay, and then one last one. It's probably the most interesting one, Mike. One of my colleagues uh, showed this one to me today. He read it yesterday. Let's see if you guys have seen something like this before. So, it's a patient in his 20s and he has uh, hyper eosinophilic syndrome. So, he has all these aneurysms in multiple places. So, coronary root. 
Uh, these are actually aneurysms as well here off of the intercostals. There's this right there. There's another aneurysm here. That's and crazy. More. And some in the liver and... Yeah, big ones in the liver and then the uh, abdomen and pelvis was separately. There's one there. One more there. They're just kind of all over the place. So have you guys seen that at all? With hyperusinophilic syndrome? Never. No. No. Yeah. I was wondering if they had some underlying like genetic disorder or some something else. Yeah, we don't know. We don't know. Yeah, it was really kind of striking. Um, hmm. Not IgG4 or, or Bachet or anything like that, right? No, no, no. But I, I guess with the hyperosinophilic, I mean, that's just a vasculitis. So I guess that that's that's the only way I can explain it. And it's and it's yeah because in, in the heart they talk about Leffler's syndrome where it starts off as inflammation, um, then it thrombosis and eventually it turns into 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 scarring. You kind of see it happening there, with the big aneurysm, it's, it's thrombus. Who knows? Maybe eventually that'll scar this thrombus in there. What is it communicating with? Can this you, one seems like it's coming off the root right there. That that bizarre. It's the root. Really? And then these the, these might be coronary here. Yeah. Oh, that's very strange. Yeah. Well, that's all I have, guys. Wow, pretty impressive. <laughs> Thanks. All righty. Anyone else want to go? I've got some cases I can show you. All righty. Who else is on? Uh, is it me Peter and you? And me. And Travis already went, so we, we should have time for everyone. All right. Here is a patient with really interesting findings so don't worry about the right pleural fluid for now but i want to show you that the interest in this case relates to this opacity which is located in the lateral segment of the right middle lobe so that is january 2022 let's go forward in time to say here I'll come back to the effusion and the other findings. So there it is. Now I'm going to change that to a bone window to give you a feel for the attenuation of this opacity. I'll go back to the lung here. Just go back to the lung again here. But you can see that's evolved from something that is ground glass in attenuation to something that is very calcified. So now let me go forward. Let's see if I just get everything in time here. So this is July. Let's go to here, which is October, and see what's happened to that blob, as David would put it. The blob is bigger, but it's still a very calcified structure. So there it is. Again, the timing here is a couple months. And there it is. Here's a pet. Howard, can you maximize your Osirix? Do you want me to make, what are you seeing that you want me to zoom? You want me to zoom okay. in? 
Maybe it's just on my screen. Does that look small on your uh, on your guys' screen? I can see it normally. Oh, okay. Maybe it's just on my end. It looks something wrong about in your end. I might like, go through. Okay. It's okay. Don't worry about it then. Okay. So there it is. Here it is on FTG Pet. So I came across this case a little bit late after a CT guided biopsy was performed of this lesion, which the pathologist who asked my opinion said, one of my colleagues saw the this biopsy, small tissue sample, and wondered about a hematoma because there's some calcifications there, but we're not really sure. And when I look at it, it doesn't look like a hematoma, but I wonder if there's some funny cells there, maybe some glandular formation. So now I'm stuck with the focal lesion that has got some calcium in it and maybe some abnormal cells. So I said, well, are the calcifications, because I was thinking, okay, now she's worried about a malignancy potentially, or at least abnormal cells. Do the calcifications look like um, somoma bodies? Because sometimes with adenocarcinoma, one can get somoma, somomatous calcifications. She said, no, no, it's not that. It's just a very strange lesion. And I don't think it's a hematoma, but there are some funny cells here. I'm not sure what to make of it. So because of uncertainty, even after the CT guided biopsy, they took it out. So here we go. Oh, the history I should give you. And I can't remember if I got the history or if I looked at this case very quickly, but I, I wish I had time to think about it some more. But anyway, didn't. So here we go. I'll fix that up if I can. Make this like this. The history is our liver transplantation months before. And here it is. So you can see the very purple staining calcifications all over the place. The rest of the lesion is really just fibroblastic tissue plugs. And the speculation is that maybe the calcifications consistent with metastatic calcifications incited a reaction so that the lung in response to the calcium deposition, which came first, chicken or egg, probably the calcium maybe, I don't know, um, resulted in intraalveolar fibroblastic buds of tissue. But final diagnosis is metastatic calcification, focal, unusual, just in the right middle lobe, um, associated with liver transplantation. And one can find articles like this about pulmonary calcinosis following liver transplantation. This one is certainly odd because it just involves that portion of lung. Instead of the more extensive upper lobe calcifications that we look for in patients with chronic renal failure, this one is just focal. So really odd. You odd. Know, there was like an injury there at some point and it started something like an infection at some point or something. Yeah, we don't know. Isn't that curious? Really interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, do a bone. So, so, Howard, one question is whether there was some transient renal failure at some point that would have predisposed to uh, to this uh, kind of metastatic calcifications. Because I've I've seen pneumonias calcify in the setting of renal failure. I see. And I, think, I think anytime you have uh, hypoxia in lung tissue, you have lung tissue damage, and you're, and you might get dystrophic calcification. If there is a renal function abnormality at the same time, then you will get a component of metastatic calcification, sort of giving you this very exuberant dystrophic kind of calcification. So that the calcification is really promoted if there's renal failure at the time that there's some sort of lung injury. I don't know. It's very intriguing. It's very curious, isn't it? Yeah. And interesting how hot it is on the FDG. You know, there's a lot of cells there, I guess. Maybe those fibroblasts, I don't know, that are taking up all that glucose and reacting to this, uh, I don't know what we call it, an insult of some kind. Very curious. So that turned out to be that. So I figure that 
now that I've seen one, if I ever see one again, I'll know, particularly a patient with liver transplantation and so on, I'll be able to make the diagnosis. And then I remembered I'm 68 years old, so I'll never have the opportunity again. So I'll leave it up to you guys to diagnose the next case of focal metastatic calcifications in a patient after liver transplantation. Okay, um, here's a real case, cool, that talked about lung edema. So check this case out. This is real. So patient comes in pretty sick. This is 57. This one is a rapid deterioration with substantial lung edema on the right side. The patient's intubated, very sick. As you'll see here, the edema remains dominantly right-sided. Patient's very sick. You can see here that got a little bit better after some circulatory support. IABP, but this was a dominant unilateral lung edema. And yes, indeed, we can see from the intraoperative TEE, as well as the findings at surgery, that indeed it's due to severe mitral regurgitation, flail anterior mitral leaflet, cardiogenic shock. And this is a real case of unilateral asymmetric lung edema from that and they replace the valve. Let's see if I have, here is a brief description of the pathology. There was a question of whether there were vegetations on the valve, but that was not confirmed on pathology. They actually described acute ischemic injury to a papillary muscle, fragments of proteinosis debris, infectious vegetation, neoplasia not identified. So yeah, very dramatic case of that. Let me show you, this is, um, let me show you another one. I've got a lot of cases here, but I wanna show you this one. Okay, this is a patient that came to us very sick. He, and I'll show you a CT in a moment. When he came in, he came in with both peripheral AV ECMO. Here you see the right atrial cannula, cardiogenic shock, and an impeller device. So just as a point of clarification, typically nowadays, when they do institute peripheral AV ECMO for a patient in cardiogenic shock, they often will put in at the same time as the cannula for AV ECMO, peripheral AV ECMO, the left ventricular impeller device to decompress the left ventricle. So that combination is actually quite common now. So that patient came in with that history and very sick. And then I will show you now that two things of interest. One is they had already diagnosed ischemia. And here you can see on this abdominal CT, the extent of the infarction involving his interventricular septum and the apical heart. So that is the MI. And then you can see here, and I'll put this alongside, a very nice example of the, and I'll scroll there, of the so-called intralobular gradient of lung edema fluid gravitating downwards towards the dependent portion of pulmonary lobules right there. So I'll leave that there and go to the picture of that from that article. Now the original article talked about re-expansion lung edema and I know Jeff has shown this case, but this is a case of just ordinary lung edema. But here is the intralobular gradient and here are the cast mountains. So just another case of, of that. Very nice down here. Yeah, that's a really good oh, example. I've seen that a lot lately, probably. Now that, yeah, we're... now that we know it exists, we can sort of recognize it. Yeah. Whereas we would go right by that. So a really nice example of the Karst Mountain sign of that intralobular gradient of lung edema in a patient with MI. Here's a case where you see a whole bunch of findings and then try to put everything together. So let me show you the radiograph. And a bunch of interesting findings. So an older person, it looks like this. 
so first off, the biggest finding, of course, are these large calcifications, which are located in different places in the mediastinum. That's finding number one. Finding number two is actually quite subtle, but if you look at pulmonary vessels in the lungs, and tell me if you agree with me, they look odd. Why do they look odd? Because it's seemingly like all the pulmonary vessels are going to a hilum, which isn't in the right place. It's almost like these vessels and the way the path they take towards the left pulmonary artery and the right pulmonary artery is odd because those arteries are almost in a sense drawn in medially. They're displaced medially. And this suggests there's a, a scarring process that's occurring symmetrically in both lungs so that these vessels and where the hyla are reflect that process. And then I will show you the third finding because we see atheromatous calcifications here, but what I'm going to show you is how much atheromatous calcifications we have in the brachiocephalic arteries coming off the aorta. Of course, in the aorta itself, but even involved in the ascending aorta along with those calcifications. So that is a form of exuberant, almost accelerated atherosclerosis. So, and then I'll show you the lungs and you get a feel for the fact that those pulmonary arteries are really drawn in. Look where the bronchi are. They're really pulled in. And then the more you look, the more you appreciate the bronchial abnormality um, and the location of the bronchial abnormality and some additional abnormality here, but very, very consistent with remote mantle radiation therapy for lymphoma. Everything fits very nicely. Do you like that case? David, you and I have been doing this for a time. And Jeff? And yeah, Aaron. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very combination of findings, huh? Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Okay. I'll show one more and then I will. There was a fair amount of vascular attenuation in that case too, peripherally. So I think those, those vessels are being knocked off centrally. I wonder how old the person was at the time of radiation. I don't know. I think, I rest or just the scarring. Yeah. Okay, so we have a person here. Let me show you, just in the interest of time, make sure I've got the right patient. Yeah, I've got the right patient. So I'll show you somewhat out of order. Here is a patient with nodules in the lungs, multifocal, multilobar. And you'll see in a moment that many of these opacities have a central solid portion and a halo of ground glass around them. So they are everywhere. There's one here. I'll try to pick out a few that show that phenomenon here, solid with a halo of ground glass around it. And here are additional ones. And this isn't in order, but already you can see there is maybe an abnormal tissue here, but I'll show you, first of all, the PET to show you that FDG AVID opacity there. Go back to the chest CT, and here is that abnormal tissue right there. And a biopsy performed of one of the nodules revealed Oh, here's a, just got one image from an MRI. There's the lesion, as you might expect. And sarcoma, an angiosarcoma. So that's probably a primary cardiac angiosarcoma in the chest with metastatic disease. Let me just read this again. Overall findings concerning for epithelioid angiosarcoma and small biopsy and so on. So undoubtedly this, I would think, is the primary lesion. And we see the metastases in the lungs with pretty typical solid lesions with ground glass halos, well known to occur in sarcomas, particularly angiosarcomas. Wow. Yeah, pretty dramatic. Ugly looking tumor. 
Heck yeah. Okay, Jeff, those are mine. All righty. David, do you have any cases? Not this week. Sorry, Jeff. No problem. I'll, I'll show a few. All right. Let me see here. All right. Do you all see a screen? So this is a patient who presented with some lymphadenopathy, um, predominantly in the inguinal region, but you can see on the FDG fused PET images, there's that node in the chest wall. There's some pleural fluid, but I'll come down and show you just here. There's, you can see all this uptake in these inguinal nodes. There's also a lot of bone marrow uptake as well. And they biopsied one of the inguinal nodes and got Langerhans cell histiocytosis. And I will show you the chest CT that was done shortly afterwards. Uh, you can see there are some cystic spaces in the lungs. There's some emphysema, there's some irregular nodules. But what was odd about the, this case, you see some of them are quite large, is this nodule here in the right lower lobe that's you know, pushing on a couple centimeters there. Um, and then there's a little bit of scarring fibrosis down there. But they ended up biopsying this nodule because we couldn't, we weren't convinced this was uh, histiocytosis. Uh, some of the upper lobe stuff maybe, and definitely some of the little thin cystic spaces, but we were not happy with this being typical longer hand cell histiocytosis. But sure enough on pathology, it looked just like the lymph nodes. So this is a systemic form of it, but I've not seen lung nodules this big or sort of this appearance. It has like these little cystic spaces in it. Um, and I, I don't know if anyone else, they, and they, also there was also a, a calvarial lesion as well. That's right. That reminds me. So yeah, this is a the systemic form that we don't usually see in adults, but has anyone ever seen LCH lung nodules that were not your typical sort of irregular stellate ones that cavitate into cysts like we see in smokers? I think I saw one long ago, Jeff, maybe 20 years ago, a big, you know, amorphous look, looking lung blob. Yeah. I yeah that is, it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, it, yeah, I mean, it doesn't surprise me given the extent of the disease. It's just, yeah, I was just, we wanna make sure we weren't missing something else. Okay, um, that was that case. Uh, this is cool. This is uh, one I have not seen before and we looked into it. So this patient came in for like uh, pre-kidney transplant and you can see um, just radiograph, you can see there's this device right here on the frontal view and on the lateral view, you can see it as well that is clearly in the right heart. And this, uh, we've seen the little micro leadless pacemakers, but this is a new one. Uh, this is made by Abbott. This is called an uh, AVER, A-V-E-I-R. Uh, it's a little bit bigger profile. We have a little bit of motion there, but you can see this is the point, this part here is attached into the RV wall and there's the circuitry there. But I was reading about it. Apparently this one has a built-in mapping it has a, in, in, within the hardware and the software that they can figure out where to place it exactly to do the pacing because it can map where the, the um, impulse is coming from. Um, hmm. So this is the only the second type I've ever seen. The ones I've usually seen are the little tiny micras that have look like a little spaceship with little claws that, that anchor into the RV, but you may start seeing these coming in. And then a colleague showed me uh, just a, uh, it wasn't a case on PAX, but it was a screenshot someone had shared with him of both RV and RA, so right atrial and right ventricular leadless pacemakers. Yep. But I've seen one of those. Okay. One of the, yeah, I showed it at this conference maybe six months ago. I came across that by chance and okay. couldn't figure that because, it, yes, as you said, it's both in the RA and the RV and it's made by a different company that you and mentioned. And I guess yep. they talk to each other so that they synchronize. Yeah, in some way they communicate yeah. with each other, which is amazing. Yeah, so this is the AVER, A, or A, I don't know how they pronounce it, A-V-E-I-R by Abbott. Um, but yeah, if you go, if you Google, you can get a picture of what it looks like. But they're bigger profile, and I guess I guess they allow, maybe they're easier to place because they don't have to do all the mapping studies up front. So we may be seeing more of those. Um, this is kind of an interesting case, and I, maybe you guys will disagree with me, and I'll that's perfectly reasonable. Uh, so this patient has uh, metastatic lung carcinoma and had these CT scans uh, just a very short period apart. Um, and on this one has 
lots of plural stuff going on, had some PE. But I want to take your attention to the right inferior pulmonary vein. You'll see here it's normal. And on this study, um, we have good contrast to pacification. I'm going to take you down to that vein. And you see there's this filling defect, and I'm on the very dense setting here. We're not, we haven't softened the window or anything. And um, I'll adjust the window a little bit now so you know what I'm looking at. But you can see there's this filling defect in the vein hmm. that I'm pretty convinced is clot, given how well-defined it is. And it measures like 40 Hounsfield units. It doesn't measure like a mixing. And I have no good explanation for a mixing artifact down there. There's PE here. There's an infarct uh, brewing down in this area as well. And I wonder if that's why their clot is forming, because we have sort of dead lung or dying lung with some tissue. Uh, there's more PE on the current one. The other possibility is the patient is hypercoagulable um, because they're getting more PE despite treatment, and that this is an in situ thrombus that may be started to propagate there. I don't think it's tumor thrombus. It's, it's too fast, and I don't really see a mass from that area that quickly. But, you know. You know venous pulmonary venous clots are really rare so i don't know is any do any of you think it's anything other than clot no it's very tubular right and it's homogeneous it's large house field units like a little worm yeah yeah it looks like clot yeah i don't yeah. think it's smoke and that's that was the one thing at first when i first yeah, looked at it, trying to see if i could explain it but you see there's pulmonary there's pe right here that's clearly um dilating that vessel out and given that infarct and the company is keeping, I just chalked it up as being part of that. But I thought it was just kind of interesting, not something we see very often. All right. And then this is the coolest case of all. And a colleague shared this with me. So this patient is a young woman who um, was um, had a baby earlier this year. So she's, uh, you can see the, the dense breast tissue from lactation came into the ED back in October or whatever with, with some chest pain, got a PE study, and it showed this funny nest of vessels here. This was done at a different hospital, but it's a good quality study. But you can see there's this kind of tangle of vessels crossing around, you know, right around the right hilum here, and there's this big, big vessel here coming behind the bronchus intermedius. Um, and this was called a pulmonary AVM. And presented to our hospital, to our interventional radiology group for, oh, shoot, let me, let me see, um, here, let me just pause my screen for a second. Let me make sure I don't have any names. Uh, no, we're good. Okay, I'll come back here. Where's the screen? Okay. So, came back um, for an angiogram to have this embolized. And so if you look at the angiogram, you can see there's really nice normal arterial filling. If that were an AVM, we should already see it. We should see an early draining vein and something. But as we go, you'll see as we go later and later, the parenchyma is enhancing, but still no AVM. And we're going to come in a little later. And we're going to start seeing, I'm going the wrong way here. Let me so Yeah, so here we see the vein draining. So now we're filling the left atrium. And you'll notice there's really nothing filling inferiorly quite at this point until late. And then we see this vessel here coming in. So we did a gated scan. Uh, let me make sure I get the right one. Yeah, so they did a gated scan. And what you'll see is we're going to look right here by the inferior, this vein that comes behind the airway. And as we track, so there it is, and we track it down. It should join up with the left atrium, but if we look very carefully, it either barely communicates or doesn't communicate at all and continues back here. So the inferior vein seems to come up to this vein here behind the bronchus and then enmesh itself with this tangle of vessels. So, so yeah, just adjacent to. Right. And then, yeah. There's and definitely a fat plane, at least you know, in most areas. Right here may be a little equivocal, but we don't see any other. There's the fat plane again on the other side. So either there's no communication or it's minimal. So this is really a meandering vein. And I, th yeah. I think this is 
not, I mean, we've seen meandering veins. Um, it's interesting, yes. literature, they're pretty rare, but we've seen them in this conference. We've talked about them. Yeah. I wonder if this is a veno-venous malformation because what else I noticed when I was looking at this is along the fissure, there's all these little funny vessels and they're probably tiny little transpleural collaterals coming in or running along that surface that are part of this malformation. Mm. I see, look along the fissure here even, there's just, there's little vessels running there and then you don't see them anywhere else. You just see the normal vessels down here, but right in this general region, I just thought it was a little busy along the fissure. And so I think so there's you no know, venous malformation with a meandering vein. Jeff, was there, was there a normal inferior pulmonary vein that communicated with the left atrium? Well, it's got here, but it doesn't seem to communicate. If I window it, you can see there's okay. got it. A now on the PE study that was done, I mean, to be fair, it's there's artifact there and there's no reason to suspect it didn't. I mean, it seems to hook up. It's just, we don't have that. We have a little bit of motion there. So the gated study brought, and without the dense mm -hmm. SBC contrast sort of brought that out better. Oh, very nice. Yeah, yeah, it's a venous malformation. Right. So and little meandering and little arcades are forming and so right. On. And then on the yeah, looking at the angiogram, you can see there's the little there's the nest of vessels, but there's no shunt. So really, it's yeah, it's not doing anything. It's just some weird developmental anomaly. A coronal MIP would look awfully good here, Jeff. Could you? I can indulge you with that. Uh, let's see. Where's my coronal button? It's He's still my heart. <laughs> Uh, let's see, uh, one of these is the MIP button. I forget where the MIP button is. Um, why am I forgetting how to do a MIP? It's not Fix showing that. up. There we go. Let's see. Uh, maybe I have to do NPR. Um, yeah, there we go. Let's see if that does it. Probably make it not quite as thick here. There we go. So let me turn off the axes. So that is cool. There, there's yeah. the vein, and you can see it just comes right up again. Well, the MEP's not good for showing that, but this is that vein here, and then this is the tangle of vessels right there. Yeah, great. Yeah. <clears throat> So I think I've seen one of these before that came to our place as well for possible AVM embolization and turned out to be one of these. I have to dig it out because I think now that I'm thinking about it, it might have features almost identical to yours. Mm -hmm. And we've totally <laughs> seen, I mean, we've seen meandering veins and I, I mean, I've seen yeah. many of them uh, just as, you know, we've seen some that look like aborted scimitars, right? They don't quite make it down to the IVC. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, but the, the good news the is cases that I've seen, Jeff didn't have the tangle of little ab abnormal looking veins here. They were much cleaner looking and they right. had normal looking branches. Exactly. But this one, uh, this one, I kind of wonder whether it sort of had to fake the communication between the the inferior and the upper ter and the upper vein territory to actually to drain the blood because you've got all those abnormal little vessels involved. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, that yeah. is very nice. And the good news is, it's you know, it's of no, it's really going to be of no consequence, right? There's no risk of embolization, right. is no shunt, so they left her alone, and they just did the CT to confirm what they were seeing on the um, angio, and the, the gating just showed because they weren't seeing that pulmonary vein draining either until right mm -hmm. until later on. So there's the artery and come in and see and see there's that superior vein, and you can see how big it is too. Yeah. And then it fills in. So Jeff, I, I think the Society of Thoracic Radiology should organize a field trip to Turkey to view the river meander, um, which is a very snaky river in this fairly flat valley. Uh, so I was on a Rick Steves tour of Turkey, you know, 15 years ago and stuff uh -huh. like that. The meander river was a highlight for me as a thoracic radiologist because I understood now where the term meandering comes That's from. That's where it comes from. Yeah, it's a snaky river in Turkey. Wow. <laughs> Maybe they should have the World Congress there. And then we can all <laughs> that is cool. Yeah. So yeah, fun case. I, I we also talked about an option we could have done also was an MR angio with um, um, you know, 
multiple, we can do multi-phase, you know, sort of a 4D flow or not 4D flow, but like um, I'm blanking on the term, but um, time resolved MRA to evaluate this. And that would have shown that, you know, we could see it at different points in time. So like, you know, like the angio, but with a little less, little bit cleaner image, but this answers the question. So they're going to, they're going to let this patient be, but um, really fun case. All right. Very that is all I have to share this week. Uh, let me stop sharing my screen, come back to everybody. And it's almost three o'clock here, so perfect. Um, Travis and I will be at the going to the ACR next week to teach the chess CT course. So um, I will be on my way to the airport during this conference. And I think Travis will be at or on his way. So um, I don't think either of us will be here, but I should be here the following week. Yeah, I think I ought to be able to do it um, unless something happens. Yeah. So. Um, yes, I'll be happy to moderate unless something weird happens All between right. now and Sounds good. Thanks, everyone, and have a good rest of your week. Thank you. Have a good year. Bye. 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 Bye.